All right, I want to welcome everyone to the Google Hangout. Today we are hosting Dr. Cecile Labuda from the University of Mississippi. She is going to give us a seminar on sound waves, shear waves in micellar fluids. You'll have to correct me on my pronunciation there. Um, she is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Mississippi. Um, I would like to say that our seminar series is supported by a grant from the University of Central Arkansas Foundation and the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at the University of Arkansas. Uh, definitely would like to thank Dr. Labuda. That's the wrong slide. Definitely want to thank Dr. Labuda for joining us today. Uh, she's going to be taking over uh, here momentarily. Take it away, Cecile. Okay. Um, I'm Cecilia Labuda, I'm a professor here at the, the University of Mississippi. Can you hear me well, or is that... It's a little garbled. It's a little garbled, okay. Is that better? That's a bit better. Okay, well, we'll see how it goes. Um, and I'm just going to talk about today sort of uh, some of the research that uh, my research group does, and in particular some of the research that I'm doing with some students right now. So I'm going to try to open up these slides. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so so I'm going to talk a little bit about just sound waves in general, shear waves and micellar fluids and kind of what we do with them and what, what they're about. Um, so I'll just give you an introduction to our research group. Uh, it's just a general description of the types of work we do, introduce acoustics a little bit, um, and then go on to talk about shear waves in the micellar fluid, which is what most of the talk today will be about. So this is our research group. Actually, not everyone is here. So it really consists of three faculty. This is Charlie Church. This is me, as I hope you recognize. And this is Bill Mobley. <laughs> and these are three of our grad students. This is Nazanin. She works with Charlie and I. She's a master's student. This is Sunitha. She works with me. And she works on the micellar fluids. And this is uh, Yukesh, who works with Joel Mobley. We have one additional student, she just started, so her picture is not here. But uh, we also have, we typically have undergrads in the group. These are three of our most recent undergrads. They just graduated last semester, so they're not here right now. Um, and we don't have any new graduate undergrads at this time, but typically we have a number of undergrads working with our, with our group. Okay, so the work we do is sort of in three main categories, you could say. So we do ultrasound physics, where we study basically the structure of ultrasound beams, what the beams do to water. So acoustic cavitation really is just talking about bubbles produced in fluids because a uh, acoustic beam, an ultrasound beam in our case, passes through the fluid. And then we also look at high intensity phenomena, so sound waves that are very, very high intensity. So another aspect of our work is we sort of look at multi-phase unstructured media. So my fluids would be kind of what I'm going to talk about today. Then suspensions, what we call acoustic metamaterials, and those are sort of things we make that will um, preferentially allow some frequencies of sound to pass through and it will block some. And other types of materials like that. And the third area we work in is biomedical ultrasonics. That's actually how our group was founded. That was the sort of work we started, we started doing. And we mostly study ultrasonic bioeffects, which basically is if ultrasound waves pass through living tissue, what, what does it do to it? That, that's, that's the kind of thing we study there. OK, so this lab that I work in, really, people here study acoustics really across a large range of frequencies. So you can sort of think about it as an acoustic spectrum in, a, in an analogous way to what you might think of as the electromagnetic spectrum, where you have infrared light, you know, visible light and, uh, uh, you know, blue light above the visible range. So we have this sort of analogous spectrum where you have a large range of frequencies of sound. So most people, when they think of sound, think of the audible region, which is here. So that goes from frequencies of... 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything above that is what we call ultrasound, and anything below that we call infrasound. So infrasound, which is very low frequencies, long wavelengths, that's produced by big things, explosions, storms, earthquakes, things like that. Audible sound, we kind of all know what that is. 
And ultrasound is typically produced, you know, you can use um, transducers, which I'll talk about that in a minute, to produce that. But, you know, some animals also produce ultrasound naturally, like bats and things like that. Um, so, basically the way sound works is sound is a mechanical wave, so you have to have matter, really, for a sound wave to, to propagate, for it to travel. So you usually have to have some sort of vibrating object that will disturb the matter adjacent to the object. So the thing vibrates. You can think of something like a drum head, for example. It vibrates. It will cause the air that, that's right adjacent to the drum head to vibrate. And it will disturb the air. And the vibration sort of travels outward, uh, or rather the disturbance travels outward. The matter itself, if you think of air, the air in the room, for instance, that doesn't actually flow, right? It sort of sits right there. It vibrates back and forth. What actually translates, what actually goes <coughs> through the air is the disturbance, and that's what we call the wave. And for sound waves, those waves are typically longitudinal, but you can have mechanical waves that are shear waves, which I'll talk about in a minute. So by a longitudinal wave, really what we mean is if I have a vibration, so let's say I had a drum head over here. Can you see my mouse pointer or no? Yes. Okay, so let's say I had a drum head here. The drum head would be vibrating like this. It causes the adjacent air particles to vibrate, so those are represented by those black dots right there. And if you look at any one particle, and there are some highlighted for you, these red ones, you can see that the particles themselves just vibrate back and forth. But the disturbance that you get sort of travels over in this direction, and it travels parallel, really, to the vibration you have. So longitudinal wave is just one where the disturbance you get, the wave, travels out in the direction that's parallel, really, to the vibration direction. And that's how sound waves typically are. But as I was saying, you can have mechanical waves that are shear, and we'll talk about those, those in, in a little while. Okay, so most of the sound waves we have are plane, which just means so you create a sound wave and it travels outward and you get this sort of large uh, sort of uh, traveling of the vibration. But you can also focus sound waves much in the same way if you take a magnifying glass or something, you can focus light, 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 light rays. So if you take a magnifying glass and you just hold it in the sun, then what you'll notice is there will be some region where the light rays focus. And if you take something like a piece of paper and you put it there, it's going to get hot enough so that the paper will burn. And it just does that because all the energy is sort of concentrated in that small area. And it's like the focus of the magnifying glass. You can do the same thing with sound. And what we use for that is what we call a transducer. And a transducer essentially just is something that will convert one form of energy to another, essentially. In the case of the transducer we use to produce sound, it's a type of crystal that we call a piezoelectric crystal. And what that means is if I run some electricity into that crystal, it causes it to expand and contract. And it's the expansion and contraction of the crystal that causes the vibration, which will then produce a, a sound wave. So if the crystal is curved like this, what it will do is it produces the sound wave when it vibrates. So you run a sinusoidal signal into it or something. The crystal vibrates, the crystal and because it's curved like that, it will focus the sound waves down to a focus like this, much in the same way that you can do with a magnifying glass. And again, you get very high intensities. The energies are concentrated, and you know you can actually you can burn things with it. In fact, if you do it at high <laughs> intensity. So here I'm going to show you an example of what you can do with focus sound. So this is a demo we like to do in our lab because really it's one of the only visual ways you can show, you know, demos with sound, I think, or at least it's very difficult to do that. There's not that many ways you can show what sound does. So this is what we call an acoustic fountain. And this object right here, this is a transducer, and it's focused, and we set it up so that the focus is right there where the surface of the water meets the surface of the air, the interface between the air and the water. And that's where you're going to have really high intensities. So I'm going to show you a video of what happens if you set this up like that. So I hope you can see that. So the wow. intensity here is so high, it will blast the water out of the tank. And you can see the water droplets come up. And this here that looks like smoke, it's not actually smoke. It really just nebulizes the water. It breaks it up into tiny, tiny droplets. And it's a sort of kind of like a vapor, really. So it nebulizes the water, and you get that. So this is what we call an acoustic fountain. And we can do that just by using the focus sound that comes from this transducer. 
And this is actually ultrasound. It is, I think, the frequency of this transducer is about the kilohertz. Okay, I did that with my iPhone. That's when I just got it, and I was very excited about my phone, so I went and I made this video. That's what happened. <laughs> okay, so, so that's kind of, of our general area. We look at ultrasound, but we also just look at, you know, kind of interesting, interesting types of, of matter. And micellar fluids... Are, is one of the one of the types of matter that we, we study. So I'm going to sort of explain what a micellar fluid is. So basically, uh, if you think of, uh, it's essentially a solution of an amphiphilic surfactant, which just means I have a long molecule. One end is hydrophilic. It's typically the head. So this is this head group right here. The other end is hydrophobic. So soap, for instance, is a molecule like that, right? So you can use soap to wash oil off your hands because one end of the soap is hydrophilic. It likes the water. The other end is hydrophobic. It's going to orient towards the oil, and it can sort of encapsulate oil in these sort of aggregates that we call micelles and take that away from your hand. So that's basically how that works. The... Um, the uh, surfactant we use is different than soap. I will get to that in a minute. But because the molecule is set up this way, and this end is hydrophilic, it enjoys being near water. This is hydrophobic. It wants nothing to do with it. If you take a bunch of these molecules and you put them in an aqueous solution, what they'll do is they'll orient themselves so that the hydrophilic ends are sort of oriented towards the aqueous solution, and the hydrophobic ends are hidden in here. And it forms these aggregates, and this aggregate is what we call a micelle. It's really just an aggregate of these surfactant molecules that form when you put them in an aqueous solution. Okay, so the simplest type of micelle you can have is this spherical type, but you can also have cylindrical micelles, so they can form these sort of longer molecules, and again, the hydrophilic ends will be on the outside here, and the hydrophobic ends will be inside. And then you can also get bilayers where you have basically micelles will uh, sort of arrange themselves like this, uh, again, with the hydrophilic ends uh, sort of oriented towards water. So you can have these different types of micelles. In our case, we use not just a surfactant. We use a mi mixture of a surfactant and a salt because what the salt does is just promotes micelle formation even more than just a surfactant in, in aqueous solution. Okay, so we use this god-awful looking uh, surfactant here, which I'm just going to call CTAB, and I'm not going to try to pronounce this hexa word, but this is basically the surfactant we use. And the salt we use is sodium salicylate. And this is actually a well-studied micelle fluid. If you did a literature search, you'd find lots and lots of uh, publications on that. Um, so it's known that if you combine the surfactant, which is what this CTAB right here, with the salt in the 5-3 ratio, it promotes formation of these cylindrical type micelles. Because, again, you can have spherical, cylindrical, bilayers, and even more complex, complex types of micelles. But in this particular ratio, it will always form uh, cylindrical micelles. So... We call our micelles worm-like because the cylinders are so long that they become very, very flexible, so we call them worm-like. If the cylinders are short, they're typically, typically called rod-like because they're much more rigid. But ours are worm-like, they're very long. Okay, so just to go back a bit, so we can actually propagate shear waves in the micellar fluid, and the way a shear wave is different than a longitudinal wave is this way. So this arrow here shows what the direction of the vibration will be, the thing that actually causes the wave to propagate. And so the vibration will be like this, but the wave itself will propagate in this direction. So a shear wave basically is one where the wave propagates in a direction that's perpendicular to the, to the vibration, as compared to a longitudinal wave where the wave propagates in a direction that's parallel to the vibration. So... You can propagate shear waves into a micellar fluid, but you can't do it into something like water. Because to propagate a shear wave, you have to be able to drag that fluid, and it has to be able to snap back, basically. <laughs> so these micellar fluids are viscoelastic, and it's the elasticity part that's really important for <laughs> propagating the shear waves into the fluid. And the viscoelasticity really just arises because... If you have these long cylinders, what will happen is they tend to entangle with each other like this. So if you try to pull some this way, the entangled ones tend to try to pull them back. And that's pretty much where the viscoelasticity comes from. 
So the way we propagate share waves into this fluid, let me see if uh, I just want to talk about this really quickly. Essentially, we take a little plate, we put it on the fluid surface, and we drag it back and forth, and the fluid basically pulls back, and you can propagate the share wave into the fluid. So I'll just show you a little bit of this fluid here, which I have in this beaker. So it's basically just a clear fluid. Can you see that at all? You have to have a green chair here. I'm sorry? Stop, stop. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stop sharing. Here we go. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so this is the micellar fluid. It's really just a clear fluid. It's very viscous. If I turn it upside down like this, if I wait long enough, it will flow, but it's really so viscous and viscoelastic, it's not going to... Wow. Okay, so you can see it sort of breaks up like that. If I let it sit for a couple hours, it will become clear again and sort of heal itself. They're often called self-healing fluids or living polymers, because if you tear through it, like you can take a knife and really sort of drag it through pretty quickly. And then if you let it sit for a while, it will sort of heal itself. So they often call them self-healing fluids. Okay, I did something funny. Group chat? No, let me close. That. Okay, there we go. I'm going to try screen sharing again. Here we go. Okay, so... Um, so we can propagate these share waves into the fluid, and as I just showed you, it's really just a clear fluid, so how can we actually see them? So one of the things we wanted to do was find a way to visualize them. And there's actually a well-known way to do that, because the micellar fluid, this particular one, is birefringent, and essentially what that means is, uh, if when I sh it's actually birefringent under stress. So when I stress the fluid, then what it can do is it can rotate polarization, polarization vectors if you pass, pass light through it. So one way to visualize it, I'll show, I'll show this picture here, is if I take a light source back here, an unpolarized light source, like a halogen light or something, or just an incandescent light, if I take one polarizer and I put it in front of the fluid with which polarization axis, let's say, vertical, and I take a second polarizer over here and I put it on the other side of the fluid with its polarization axis horizontal, which means I have the polarization axis per per perpendicular to each other. If the fluid is just sitting there and I'm not doing anything to it, it just does like everything else. So light will come through the unpolarized light. It gets polarized through this first polarizer and the, let's say the polarization axis is this way. So then you have these light rays coming through that are polarized vertically. Then it goes through the fluid, doesn't do anything to it. It reaches the second polarizer, which has a polarization axis perpendicular to the direction of polarization. And what you end up, up, end up with here is just nothing. It just gives you no light passing through because the two polarizers are crossed and all the light has been blocked. Okay, but when you actually shear the fluid, so if you vibrate this plate here, like so, then what happens is now the fluid is stressed. And what it does when it's stressed is, if you have polarized light coming through the fluid, it rotates the polarization vector a little. So by the time the light rays come out of the fluid right here, then because the polarization axis of these light rays has been rotated, then you're going to get some light passing through the second polarizer. And you get a sort of pattern that looks like this. And you can look at this on the high-speed video camera. And you can observe how the pattern moves, and that basically shows you what the shear wave is doing to the fluid. And I'll show this in just a minute. OK, another way to do this is just take a bunch of particles, put them in the fluid, and watch them vibrate. And the great thing about this is, if I have some particles in the fluid and it's vibrating because I have some wave passing through it, it's pretty clear what it's doing. I don't have to try to figure out, well, is it the wave that's doing that? What's that pattern got to do with? Essentially, I can just watch the particles vibrate. So that's one way we decided to try to do this, to see basically how does the shear wave actually propagate through that fluid. And we just got some polyethylene microspheres, pretty tiny, 200 micrometers. Distribute them through the fluid, and the density of the spheres is basically the same as the density of the fluid. So you can distribute that pretty well. So on the right here, where you see this sort of reddish looking fluid, it just looks red because the microspheres themselves are red. You can mix them into the fluid. And then when you, when you generate the shear wave on the fluid, you can actually see those microspheres vibrate. The way we look at that is we basically take some video with a high-speed camera we have uh, right here. 
and you can base, you can take a video of the microspheres vibrating, and then you can go and look and see what it looks like. And here's a video of that. So we take a plate like here, we rest it on top of the fluid, you vibrate it back and forth, and it produces the shear wave that travels in this direction. And these microspheres show up as these black dots because the high-speed video really just makes black and white video, and we can see exactly what the shear wave is doing. We can even measure things like the wavelength of the shear wave. The way we do that is, oh, I'll come back to this. The way we do that is we can basically take the video that we capture and we can basically break it into frames, uh, use a little program that's called ImageJ. It's a free program. It's really very, very useful. And you can use it to track the particles. And you can track the paths of the particles, and it, they really just travel on sort of this elliptical path that looks like this. And then what you can do is, the particles are everywhere in the fluid all throughout here like so. You can look at the paths of the particles, and what you can do is look for particles that vibrate in phase. So they reach their maximum and their minimum at the same time. And here's some examples. These particles right here, and these particles right here, I know this is not a very good image, I'm sorry. They vibrate in phase, and essentially if two particles vibrate in phase, that means they have to be one wavelength apart. So once I find pairs of particles that vibrate in phase like this, I can just go in and measure how far apart they are. That tells me what the wavelength of the, of the wave is. So this is kind of a really nice way to look to see how a wave behaves in the fluid because you're essentially looking at what the particles do when the wave propagates through, and you can just measure the wavelength just by finding two particles that vibrate you know, in phase. They reach their maxima and minima at the same time. So, um, so this was an experiment that was done by one of the undergrads that actually was his honors thesis, and we were able to publish this. He really did a nice job, job with that. So um, I'm going to go back one slide. So here I showed the wave passing through and you can see the particles vibrating. We also did a sort of combination video where we placed the fluid between the cross polarizers and this sort of pattern that you see propagating down that really just arises because the particle, the, the fluid is able to rotate the polarization axis and then you get some light, light passing through the fluid when it does that. So that sort of just shows, shows uh, how you can visualize the wave both using sort of like polarization and the fact that the fluid rotates the polarization axis when it's under stress, and you can also see the, the microspheres in here. Okay, so we measured the wavelength, looks like about 12 millimeters, and I should have mentioned this, the frequency with which we vibrate the plates on the top of the fluid is just 61 hertz, and if you know the wavelength and the frequency, then you can calculate the wave speed is just the frequency times the wavelength, and that ends up being 733 millimeters per second. So this is kind of interesting, right? The speed of this shear wave is 733 millimeters per second. That's like 0.7 meters per second. I feel like I can walk faster than 0.7 meters per second. So it's a really very slow traveling, slow traveling wave. <laughs> so, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so, so here we were just doing this experiment to sort of look to see, well, if we put these particles in, when we, which tells us exactly what the wave is doing to the fluid, well, can we find the wavelength? Can we look at how the wave travels? Can we visualize the wave in some way other than just looking at the birefringence pattern? Which, you know, we know what that looks like, but what it actually means in reference to the wave was not, not quite clear, I would say. So this was just another way of sort of looking at the shear wave. Okay, so this, these micellar fluids are really very interesting fluids and they have, they exhibit very interesting phenomena. So what we wanted to do was, okay, look to see under different physical conditions what the behavior of the fluid is. And the tool we're going to use to sort of see, you know, what, how the fluid behavior changes is just measuring the shear wave speed. And I'll explain why that tells you something in a minute. Okay, so the fluid microstructure, and by the microstructure, what I mean is, I sort of showed you that you get these aggregates that we call micelles, and they can produce spherical micelles, cylindrical micelles, bilayers, and also you can get these entanglements of these um, 
cylindrical micelles. Um, and so by the microstructure, what I mean is how those uh, molecules are aggregated, what the micelles look like. And there really is a huge range of sort of topologies the micelles can take on, uh, not just spherical, cylindrical, and bilayer. Really, there's just a lot, lot in between. So what we've seen in the past, we've done experiments looking at varying the concentration of those fluids. Uh, and we see that as we vary the concentration, the shear wave speed changes. It changes continuously in some regimes, and then we get discontinuities. And what we think is that these discontinuities basically show us that there is some change going on in the fluid microstructure. The micelle shapes are changing, or they are entangling with each other in, in different ways. So I'll just show you this result we had previously. So on this axis here, this shows the concentration of CTAB, which is the surfactant we use to make the micellar fluid. And here this shows the shear speed of the fluid on the vertical axis. So at low concentrations, you can see that here you have the, the shear speed sort of gradually increases. It actually goes like the square root of the concentration. And then all of a sudden, we have this discontinuity here. It looks pretty linear here. And then there's another discontinuity, and you get another linear regime but it's a different slope. And what we think is, in these regions where you get discontinuities, the microstructure of the fluid, what the masses look like, is, is probably changing. And that seems to happen kind of around 200 millimolar concentration, and then again at about, I think this was probably like <coughs> 380 millimolar. I don't remember exactly. So we saw that. And because we know that the way the micelles arrange themselves, or rather the way the surfactant molecules arrange themselves into micelles, depends on the concentration of the micellar fluid. It depends on things like temperature, and actually depends on other physical properties. We thought, okay, let's go see if varying the temperature will show these sorts of discontinuities, which we believe indicates that the, micellar, the micelles, the microstructure of the fluid, the way the micelles are arranged is changing. So we did this study, uh, and so the setup we use looks like this. So here we have a light source, uh, and we have a diffuser, which just means it's essentially a piece of paper that makes the light be uniformly distributed over the region that we want to look at. There is this little plate that we use to generate the shear waves, so we just place the plate on the fluid surface, vibrate it back and forth, and we get a shear wave propagating this way. And then we have this container with two walls. So in this area right here, we can pump water into, sorry, into the, into the container right here. And it doesn't actually run into the fluid because this is really the outer wall. And the whole point of being able to do that is we can use heated and cooled water to control the temperature of the fluid. And then we have this camera here where we can take video. And the way we look at the uh, shear waves in this case is we just use the birefringence patterns. That's these patterns that you can see through the cross polarizers when you when you stress the fluid. Because for the temperature, we didn't want to have uh, microspheres in there. We just wanted to look and see what the fluid does as very temperature. Okay, so here's a picture of the setup. So right here, this is the clear micellar fluid. These are the outer walls. And then we pump the water in right here, and we vary the temperature using a water bath. We can go really from you know, zero degrees all the way up to at least 40, and even higher. Um, here's the high-speed camera, and this is just the backlight. And like I said, the diffuser is, here's this piece of paper that we mounted in this piece of cardboard. That's basically what we did. <laughs> so we just used a little mechanical shaker here. I don't know if you have those. All it does, it just vibrates back and forth at you know, some frequency you set. And the frequency we use is 61 hertz, which sounds kind of strange. But the reason we use 61 and not, not let's say, 60 hertz is just because the, the frequency of your wall power is 60 hertz. And you can get all kinds of noise if you operate at the same frequency as you know, what you plug the lamp into or the, or the camera or anything like that. So we just sort of what went one, you know, one hertz higher, and we just run at 61 hertz. Okay, so these, this is what the uh, uh, this is what the let's see if I can click on this here. This is what you get on your high speed video when you share the fluid. So you get these patterns that just propagate downward through the fluid. So this would be where the plate is up here, 
and you'll be vibrating like this, you get your shear waves that travel downward, and because you have it between these cross polarizers and you're stressing the fluid, then you get these patterns. And however fast these patterns propagate downward, that's basically what the speed of the shear wave is. Okay. So here I'd just like to show you, let me stop this here. So this is like a, uh, just like a frame we grabbed from this video right here. And the wavelength of the wave really is just from the center of pick any one of these fringe patterns you want to the center of not the next one, but the third fringe really. Because this would be kind of like where you have no displacement. This is where you have maximum displacement. You're back to zero here, and then you come back to maximum again. I think I have a picture of this somewhere. But anyway, your, wave would look, your wavelength would look like this, basically. Like that. Sorry. Let me see if I can. It basically looks like this. OK. All right, so we take these videos. And what we do is we set some temperature by cycling the water. So let's say we want to measure the shear wave speed when the fluid is at 25 degrees. We would set up the water bath to produce water at 25 degrees. It would heat it up. And then we just cycle it out here. These are, these are the outer walls. And we have thermocouples in the fluid. And we just wait until it gets to the temperature we want. Then we share the fluid. And we can capture video with the high speed camera. And what we do is, to measure the shear wave speed, is we just pick one of these fringe patterns and we just track how it propagates through the fluid. And we just use a program to do that that was written by actually one of our undergraduate students. OK, so basically, if you track one of these fringes down through the frame, and you know what the frame rate is, basically, if you know what the time between successive frames is, if you know how far it travels between the first frame and the next frame, and you know how much time there is between the first frame and the next frame, then you can calculate the speed at which this fringe propagates downward. That's just going to be the distance it travels divided by the time it does that in. And that basically gives you the shear wave speed. Because these patterns travel along with the shear wave. In fact, they're generated by the shear wave. So if you know how fast they travel, then you essentially know what the shear wave speed is. So we did this over a range of temperatures from 20 degrees up to 45 degrees. And then we did a low temperature study from 8 degrees Celsius up to 20 degrees again. So what we got, and this is actually ongoing work, so you know it's not all fancied up yet. <laughs> uh, but what we see is it looks like you have sort of these three regimes. So I can't really say what's going on here. You can see there's a lot of scatter. But it does look like when you get to about 27 degrees, it sort of flattens out here. And then here you have a discontinuity. That's about, I want to say, 36 degrees. And again, you have a lot of scatter. So what we think is when you get to 27 degrees, you probably have a change in the fluid microstructure. And then it goes into this sort of regime of shear wave speeds. Here it looks a lot clearer, because you can see it sort of jumps up. So we think at about 36 degrees and 27 degrees, you probably have some change in the fluid microstructure. The micelles, the arrangements of those surfactant molecules is probably changing at those temperatures. So that's what we think. At the lower temperatures, uh, I, I would say here it's not as clear. I do think here you have sort of like a, some kind of curvature. This looks more or less linear, and this looks kind of like a different slope, but also linear. So possibly, you might have changes in microstructure here and here. But at any rate, you can see that uh, overall, while you have an increase in the shear wave speed as you increase in temperature, it doesn't really do that linearly. And actually, it doesn't even do this in any kind of, it, it, if I had to fit this, it would probably be a, some kind of polynomial. It looks kind of linear here and here, I think. And here, it, it sort of looks like a little bit of a curve. <laughs> So that's what we have for our high temperatures. Here, I think this is probably the clearest discontinuity. And for lower temperatures, we have something that looks like that. Uh, and probably there is a discontinuity here. Um, and so the, the issue we have now is we can sort of measure these discontinuities in shear wave speed. And we think that indicates that the fluid microstructure changes somehow. But we don't really know how it changes. We really have no way of knowing that. All we know is that something is happening to really cause sort of a discontinuous change in the shear wave speed 
we don't know exactly what's happening. And we don't have a way to know that by using acoustic techniques. OK, so really, micellar fluids are very complex. They exhibit very interesting phenomena. And you can probe that using shear waves. I have to say it's a lot more complex than I've sort of talked about. To take these sorts of measurements, it really takes a lot of time. And typically, what we find happens is if we measure the shear wave speed in the micellar fluid at 20 degrees, let's say, for every single day, for like a month. So over some amount of time, it seems to be constant. But it does look like the fluid stiffens up somehow, because the shear wave speed seems to sort of move upward over time. We're not exactly sure what's going on here. It's also very, very hard to take two sets of measurements and get, get you know, exactly the same measurements. So here, for instance, if you look on this plot, you can see that you have two sets of data. So the blue ones were taken by starting from 20 degrees up here and cooling down to 8 degrees down here. The red ones were taken by heating up the fluid starting at, I want to say, 9 degrees down here and heating it up to 20 degrees down here. This is probably the best data set we've ever had where if you take like a heating cooling cycle, it looks like the shear wave speeds track back as you go back up in temperature. Typically what we have happening is we seem to get like a shift when we try to go back up from low temperature to high temperature. We're not sure if it's because when we heat the micellar fluid, some of it evaporates and maybe the concentration is changing because the shear wave speed also depends on concentration. We're not sure if just over time maybe because these are complex fluids and you have these long uh, warm like my cells that entangle, maybe it sort of sets into some sort of, you know, more permanent structure. We really just don't know. Um, and we're not, you know, we don't have any good way, really, at least not that that's accessible to us to actually look at the, at the fluid microstructures. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say we need to determine what actually is happening to the fluid when we see these discontinuities in the shear wave speed, because we really don't know. We think it means that the microstructure changes, but we really, we really can't say that in, in any definite way. OK, so I'd just like to summarize by saying at least one part of my summary here is we really do a very broad range of research in the physical ultrasonics group. A lot of it is work that uh, you know undergraduates do very good work, work for us. Like I, I tried to, to, at least I hope I got that across. Um, uh, so we have students really at really every level in the group, undergrads to master students to PhD students. Um, and some of them come in over the summer because we have a program, it's sort of like an REU type program here at uh, NCPA, the National Center for Physical Acoustics, where we have undergrads come in from different schools and they work with different professors here at NCPA. And we get very good research done really during the summer under that program. So I'll just leave you with some pictures of our group. Uh, this is kind of uh, in our lab. This is one of our sort of workhorse, workhorse tanks. Pretty much all our stuff is done in water. This is the student who works on the micellar fluids. And that's her setup. And here's one of our other students giving the poster. Here I am. This is a while back. You can see I don't look as old as I do now. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's kind of where I'm going to stop right here. So I will stop sharing the screen. And just see if you have any questions. Or if there's anything I need to clarify that I sort of ran through too quickly, you can let me know. OK. Does anyone have any questions they would like me to answer, or anything at all? I have, I have a question. Uh, when you're saying that you're uh, hypothesizing that the, there's a change in the microstructure of this, um, are you saying that it's going to change out of that worm-like structure or just a change in the way that the worm-like structure is sort of like, I don't know, like wrapping itself around each other or something? Okay, so exactly, we don't know, but what I think is, so for example, one thing that could happen is, so you have these long worm-like micelles, it could be that they, once they go through some temperature, maybe they get shorter. And so if they get shorter, then the entanglement is not going to be as tight, and so the shear waves would behave differently. Another thing that's known to happen is you sort of get these uh, two-phase fluids, which just means you might have a fluid that instead of having 
mostly worm-like micelles, you might have a mixture of worm-like ones and spherical ones. So if it goes into these sort of two-phase type fluids, then again that would that would affect the shear waves because pretty much anything that that affects the elasticity of the fluid is going to affect the shear waves in in not a continuous way. So it could be the length of the micelles, it could be that it goes from spherical to cylindrical. <coughs> It could be that they become more or less entangled. It's really just, it's, it's not something that we, we actually know. So. Okay. Cecile, while you're there, uh, is the, uh, the RU program, do you have like a web link or anything you could show on the uh, screen share for where students can go oh, to apply? I can find that. Uh, I think we do have one. And is, will that uh, be running again in the summer, upcoming summer, 2016? Yeah, it runs every year, and um, let's see here. Uh, apparently, we're not very good at keeping that up to date, but this is the, I think this is the last post. Uh -huh. There has a poster that sort of describes the program, and usually what we do is each year, how do I share a link in chat? or? Um, yeah, you could um, share it in chat or just pull it up on your um, screen share. Oh, yeah, I could just screen share that. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see. So I'm not real. Okay, all right. Sorry, I'm a newbie when it comes to this whole... You're doing great. Okay. Well, not that great because I have it here, but I'm not sure how to screen share it. It's in it's in another window of Chrome, I guess. Maybe it's this one. No, no. no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not able to do that. <laughs> Where is it on the uh, NCPA webpage? Yeah. I'm gonna just send a link through chat and maybe you can try to pull it up. I seem to be lost here. Okay. Okay, so this is just a sort of like a brochure that kind of sh talks about what the program is about. This is for, not even for the 2015 one, that's for the 2014 one, but essentially we open up applications on the website each year and, you know, we usually take about between three and four students and typically what happens is we advertise, yeah, that's it right there. We advertise some projects, and uh, if students are interested in any one of them, they can apply, or even if you just, you know, like, for example, Dr. Slayton here knows me, so if one of, you know, one of the students he knows might be interested in some type of project, I could just propose it for the BAS program, and then you would just apply, and uh, if you get accepted, What's nice about it is we set you up in one of the dorms, you get a stipend, it's really everything is covered, so you have really no expenses, really. Wow, that's fantastic. It's a pretty good program, and uh, really every year, you know, not all of the students, but pretty much we have at least one publication involving the student from the program each year. So if we have four students, at least one of them will have something publishable. Um, so. So it's, it's, it's a pretty good program. So I hope that you might consider applying for it if you have any interest in acoustics. And it's not just in ultrasonics. It can be in infrasound. Really, there's many, many different acoustics labs, acoustics groups in the lab. So, so what's the next step with the uh, research in these materials? It, uh, it's difficult to visualize what's happening on that microscopic level. What, what do you want to do next? Yeah, so, so okay, so that's actually one of our big things. I think we have to find some way of trying to figure out what's actually going on. Another thing I would like to do is because, so the way we visualize the fluids when we do these sort of more complex studies is we just use these sort of like this optical method of with cross polarizers and the birefringence patterns. Yeah. Uh, we feel like we need to find a way to sort of optically detect the shear waves, even if not optically, acoustically, even if we can't track it through the fluid, but at least be able to detect it at the container wall or something, because acoustics is what I know. There's nothing wrong with the birefringence, but I mean, I just think we should find a way to do that optically. And the thing that we're sort of really big on right now, so the way we generate the shear waves is we just take this plate on the fluid surface and we, we go like this, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, in, in biomedical ultrasonics with new imaging techniques, they actually use shear waves for imaging now, and the way they generate them is they'll take a focus transducer, like I showed you earlier, and when you send the focus beam in, because the pressure in the focus is much higher than in the surrounding fluid, it actually shares the fluid, and you can get shear waves traveling sort of outward away from the focal region. And that's actually how shear waves are generated when you do uh, elasticity imaging with, with ultrasound. So we already have a system set up where we can generate the shear waves that way, and sort of, we want to sort of go in that direction because that's just really how it's done uh, if you do elasticity imaging. So, so that's kind of where we're headed, and then we have, you know, some sort of other ideas about how to investigate the fluids. Some of them are kind of not even close to being half baked. So, so, so that's kind of where we are. <laughs> uh, are. Are those fluids mainly the interest in those fluids? Uh, besides being just just the academic interest, because it's neat, uh, because of the biomedical self healing sort of properties of them. So the self-healing property to do with the fluid is kind of like a property of the fluid. It doesn't really do any type of you know healing of, of people or anything. Right. But one, actually, there's several reasons to study these types of fluids. First of all, my cells are everywhere, right? I mean, all our cells in our body are pretty much micellar type structures. That's basically uh, what they are. So cell walls are these types of bilayers and, and all that. So really, there are many, many applications. So... Even surfactants, there's a lot of, of sort of uh, surfactant work going on on an industry, and surfactants pretty much form my cells. So you can find my cells really pretty much in, in a, really a wide range of fields. So to study my cell fluids, it sort of has this kind of general purpose, you know, type of uh, interest. Um, and also, even in, in beauty products. I know this sounds crazy, but they have things called micellar waters, which they sell for very high prices, which are, I'm quite sure, totally useless. But, you know, those things are pretty much pretty much everywhere. So there's kind of a general purpose interest in micellars in general and micellar fluids, fluids also. So I remember at some of the Acoustical Society meetings, sitting in on some of the, um, the ultrasound and the high food sessions, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of... of complications in understanding how high-intensity focused ultrasound propagated through uh, body material, you know, mm -hmm. of tissue. Uh, are these micellular fluids from what you just described, is it a way of trying to simplify and understand a, a human tissue and propagation through a, a very, very simple human-like tissue? Uh, so Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so to kind of get some understanding to build towards a better understanding of how to use the uh, high food for medical um, procedures. So, uh, so for example, when I was talking about elasticity imaging, this really is so your typical ultrasound imaging that we all know about is kind of like a pulse echo imaging, right? You send yeah. in some sound, it reflects from a tissue, it comes back, and it tells you something about what that tissue is like. Okay, so elasticity imaging, the way that works is what they want to know is not just what the tissues look like, but how stiff they are and things like that. Because typically when tissue becomes diseased, it just gets a lot harder. So you can detect things like tumors if you can get a relative measure of stiffness, and the way they do that is by sending shear waves into tissue. Ah. So the only issue with tissue, if you really want to know exactly what's happening, is that's just opaque, right? You can't yeah. see through it in any way, shape, or form. So the nice thing about the micellar fluids, at least this particular one, is it's just optically clear. So if you want to, if, if, if one of the things you can do with it is, if you want to understand in ways that you can't really, uh, how the shear waves actually interact with tissue-like material like that, because it's viscoelastic, which is really the important property here. Um, the micellar fluid sort of gives you like a, a sort of like a model system that you can look at, not just acoustically, but also optically too. I think it, it, it will help you to get like some better understanding of how the show is interact with viscoelastic media, which is kind of what tissue is. Right. So. Cool. That's neat. That's really cool. 
Yeah, it's it's really it's it's kind of like this fun fluid. It it does really very interesting things. Like if you if you like take a, a mix or like a spatula and you wind it through really slowly, it'll just unwind itself. It just does all kinds of things. It's like a it's like it's like Alice in the rabbit hole. You can find fifty different projects to do on this thing. It's, just, it's really so complex. I mean, some of it you just get stuck on doing these measurements, and it takes months and months. And then you try to take another set, and it doesn't look like the first one. It's a mess. But but it's really fun, and it's really really interesting. And uh, we've had quite a few students students work on it. So cool, cool. I it was years ago. I played around with trying to do. Uh, uh, what sounds to be measurements in Ublet, which is that suspension of, of oh, cornstarch. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, this is great. You could do the same technique with the shaker. I never thought to try that. But it's not optically opaque, and so that would be kind of tough. Yeah. But, but cool. Yeah, Ublet would be a fun summer, summer student project. To... I've never actually seen Ublet, I don't think. I've only heard of it. <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to Google that one. Yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, demos done with it, I think, but but I've never actually, you know, played with it myself. So. So so what you need to do is is Google Ublek in a speaker. Uh -huh. Oh no no, I've seen that. I've seen that demo. Yeah. It yeah. Crazy so, so it's got that same. Yes yes yes. It's got that same sort of weight. It's got a stiff. It 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 gets stiffer depending upon how it's sheared. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so what happens if you put this micellular fluid stuff in a speaker? Does it and you vibrate it up and down? Does it do weird shit like that too? Not like that, because what <laughs> happens is <laughs> real technical term there, weird shit. <laughs> so, so what happens is it depends on how fast is the vibration. If yeah. you do it fast with large amplitude, it just it's just gonna tear up. See, like see, like this. Yeah. So if I go like this and I just wait, it will. It's just gonna flow. But if I go, it just sort of breaks up into these like chunks. Okay. Okay. So it depends on you know how fast and what frequency you're kind of working at. Okay. So the Ublack I think works better on on things like speakers where you are at you know 60, 40, right. 50 hertz or whatever. Cool. So yeah. Let me let me open it up to some questions there from uh, Suffolk University. I, I have I turned off your microphone. I can't seem to figure out how to get it unmuted. If you guys have any questions, uh, type in on your uh, your chat window. You can talk. Okay. Can you hear us no, now? I can hear you. Yeah. Any questions there? I was curious. Uh, what are the uh, so the micellar fluid that you had was uh, saline type solution, is that right? No, it's like uh, so the salt is like sodium salicylate, and we use this. It's like hexadecyl, so, you know, some well, long molecule called CTAB. It's not really saline solution. There okay. is a salt there, but it's uh, what the salt does is um, so the salt in the aqueous solution just promotes the micell formation because uh, so it just it just it just helps to promote the it, it essentially what it does is it, it, it provides more shielding to the hydrophilic hydrophobic ends of the molecules. And so it sort of forces them into these micellar structures much more efficiently than if you just did it in water. I was gonna ask you, is is there any uh, places in nature where we see something like this? like a micellar fluid? I mean not necessarily with our with our uh, bodies, but in, in the bigger picture, um, in nature? Just in nature? So, I mean, mostly the micelles that occur in nature occur in living organisms. You do have, you know, things like, I mean, I, I don't know if you'd consider soap a sort of natural thing, but, but soap tends to form micelles. Then there's things they use in uh, the oil industry that are micellar fluids uh, for various things. Um, so there's a lot of industrial ones that are sort of man-made, but mostly the natural ones I know of are kind of in, like, living organisms, micelles. Actually. And soap and stuff. So so yeah, but but you know they are are quite quite interesting interesting things. And actually, with the if you look at the worm-like ones, so one thing that's interesting about them, if you have sort of polymers, polymers form long molecules too. But these are sort of, for lack of a better term that I can think of right now, they're sort of like permanent molecules. The thing about these worm-like micelles is. 
you know, they break apart and sort of reattach all the time. They're not very, very strongly bonded in any way, shape, or form. So you get these long worms, they can break and rejoin, and they do all these types of things. And that's actually part of what, what makes them so interesting. They just exhibit all kinds of properties because of that. Hmm. Thanks. All right. Any other questions there? So up the university. All right. If anything pops up, just holler. You can leave the microphone unmuted. I think we'll be okay. Yeah. So Cecile, what what sort of advice might you give undergrads? You've got undergrads here in Arkansas and undergrads there in uh, Massachusetts. What sort of advice might you have for current undergrads? So I mean, I think you know, I, I really think that for undergrads, one thing I think that's really important is to get involved in some kind of research. It doesn't have to be any fancy research. When I was an undergrad, I worked with a group that did uh, research in educational physics. And basically what that was about was, you know, pick any old problem you have at the end of chapter of, I don't know, mechanics or something. There's like all kinds of interesting research you can do with very, very simple things. So I remember one of the project I, projects I worked on was just, you know, here's a wheel and it's, it's like pressing against this step and you try to pull it against the step and how does it do that? And it did that in a very discontinuous way and we really had some very interesting results with that. So I mean I just think any type of physics that's not just in the classroom I think is it's really important to do it. It's just you just you just find all kinds of interesting things, even in things that might not look look that interesting. And and you know it, it to me it was kind of what you know when you just got tired of doing your fifty F homework set that took all week long and all this. That was kind of the thing that sort of kept me interested interested in physics. So I mean I just think it's it's really important. And I mean if you're interested in going to grad school, I think grad schools kind of look for that now, I think. They didn't used to do that so much before, but I have the impression that they do look for that for that now. Oh, and actually one piece of advice I think is kind of important is uh, so we all get really deep into our classes, I remember that, but you have to stop and have some fun too. Just I'm often forget to do that. <laughs> so, I think I think that's important. You can burn yourself out just, you know. Anyway, <laughs> so that's that's hard to stop and have fun when you've got homework due and a paper due. But you're right. You need to pull back. Yeah. Every now and then, you just you just have to do it. Really. <laughs> so. It's probably not what I should be telling students. <laughs> I, I, do think, I really think it matters. You just, you know, you, you have to stop every now and then. Just go do something you want to do that you enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah I, I remember that um, educational research group there at Ole Miss, and, and there was a really a great um, group of students that were working on projects that, that you all had a lot of fun. That, yeah, it was, it was really good, you know. So, and you know, you sort of, you know, you get, that's kind of how you get to, at least me, that's how I got to know some of the students pretty well. And it, it just, you know, it just sort of keeps the interest alive, I think, because it's just, you know, you can see the physics there, but it's not just, I'm going to work these 10 more problems, which I admit was fun because I really enjoyed working some problems. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I was like, ooh, let me work this problem. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, doing sort of physics outside the classroom is, is kind of fun, so I really think it helps. Yeah. So what's it been like transitioning to now being a professor? Yeah, that was kind of weird because, you know, it's very unusual for someone to become a professor at the same place they, they went to grad school. That doesn't happen very often. Right. So that was kind of awkward in a way because, I mean, you know, you can, basically this, the people who you were taking classes from all of a sudden are your colleagues, right? So it was, it was this, it was very strange, but, but uh, sort of over time it just kind of normalizes, but it, it was kind of awkward, I have to say, definitely. <laughs> it was. <laughs> So uh, for the students here and the students in, in uh, Boston, 
So I've known Cecile for, God, how many years now? I don't know, a long time. It's been a long time. So, yeah, I, I can ask her some questions. Hey, I might not be able to ask other people, but <laughs> our history goes way back. Long time. If you ever go to an acoustical society conference, you want to hang out with Cecile. She's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, fantastic. Do we have any more questions here at uh, Central Arkansas or any questions there in Boston? Okay, well, if any of you all think you might be interested in the, in the BAS program, you can either email me directly and I'll send you information. Uh, I don't know when it's advertised again, or you can just uh, talk to Willie right there. He he has all my contact information, and uh, you know if you if you think I might be interested in that, I think it's a good program to apply for. Okay, I will definitely share that PDF with um, the folks there at Suffolk, and we'll definitely tweet it out here later on. Hopefully okay, I'll try to get the newest work. version of the PDF. I think that one's two years old. I'll get you the newest one. <laughs> okay. All right. Would you please email that to me, and then I'll uh, share that with everyone. Yeah, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. This has been a great seminar. Thank you all for the Google Hangout because I, I thought it would be a total disaster. I'll just have to <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to put up my slides. No one's going to see them. <laughs> it was a kind of nice experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, I love those little videos of the, uh, that you took of the, the shear waves and everything. That was cool. So. Yeah, I'll put those up somewhere. Actually, if you, I don't know if you, what you do with the slides usually, but I can send those if you want one of the videos. Yes, yeah. yes. When you send that PDF, would you send me those YouTube links? Yeah, I'll send, send it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Cecile. Appreciate it. Take Bye. care. Bye.